Let's take a journey through the Mojave's most iconic and mysterious locations. Today, we're diving deep into the untold stories of the places we've all wandered through, uncovering secrets. Greetings, Martyr, and welcome. If you're here now, it means you've been offered up as a sacrifice so that your vault can continue to thrive. Can you see them? Good. From the pre-war days and the events leading up to the world of New Vegas as we know it. From the glow of the fabulous New Vegas sign to the hidden depths of Vault 34 and the tragic past of Camp Searchlight, we'll explore how these places shaped the wasteland. Stick around as we reveal the stories you didn't know and the history you've always wondered about and the connections that make each of these locations more than just a spot on your map. Kicking it off, let's dive into the beating heart of the Mojave, the Strip. Long before the bombs fell, Las Vegas was a thriving tourist destination, known for its bright lights, casinos, and the endless entertainment. Founded in 1905, the city grew into an iconic symbol of American excess. But everything changed on October 23rd, 2077, when nuclear fire engulfed the world. Las Vegas might have been reduced to ash like so many other cities, but one man, Robert House, saw the catastrophe coming. Using his immense wealth and genius, he fortified the city with advanced defense missiles, laser turrets, and more, protecting the core of Las Vegas from the worst of the destruction. Though. A few bombs managed to slip through. The Strip was spared from total annihilation. For over 200 years, the city lay dormant, with House trapped in a coma-like state, his systems barely functioning. The once glorious Strip was overrun by overgrowth, raiders, and tribals, a shadow of its former self. But when House finally awoke, he wasted no time. His vision was clear. Restore Las Vegas to its pre-war glory. Through his Securitrons, House struck deals with the local tribes, transforming them into the three families, Omertas, Chairman, and the White Glove Society. Together, they rebuilt the casinos, restored the neon lights, and turned the strip into a beacon of hope and power in the desolate of Mojave. House's influence was so strong that even the NCR and Caesar's Legion took notice both eager to control this oasis of civilization. So, as you step onto the Strip, remember, it's more than just a glittering facade. It's a monument to survival, ambition, and the relentless drive of one man to preserve the past while shaping the future. The fabulous New Vegas sign is more than just an unmarked location in the Mojave Wasteland. It's a symbol that feels like home to me capturing the essence of everything I love about New Vegas. Positioned just north of the main entrance to Camp McCarran, near the southern wall of the Strip, this sign is iconic in its design and significance. The sign, altered in the Fallout universe, proudly displays new over the original loss, with the E cleverly replaced by reverse number 3. A cheeky smile face painted in the O of welcome adds to its charm making it a perfect representation of the quirky, resilient spirit of New Vegas. Even though the platform on the back, featured in the game's cinematic intro, is inaccessible to the player, it adds a layer of mystery and nostalgia, making me appreciate it even more. For me, every time I see that sign, it's like being welcomed back to a place I love. A place that truly feels like home. Originally founded as Alamo Airport in 1942, McCarran International Airport became Las Vegas' primary airport after it was renamed in 1948. Decades later, the arid Mojave preserved its structures well enough for the New California Republic to seize it after the New Vegas Treaty in 2274. The NCR transformed the abandoned airport into Camp McCarran, the nerve center for their military operations in the Mojave. It became a vital hub for troop movements, supply lines, and intelligence. All while constantly under the siege by the Fiends, a ruthless gang of chem addicted raiders. Camp McCarran, despite its formidable defenses and large garrison, 
suffers from the relentless attacks of the fiends and internal sabotage from Caesar's Legion's spies. The base's strategic value lies in its monorail connection to the Strip, allowing rapid development of NCR forces. However, even with its importance, the camp is shorthanded, stretching its troops thin across the Mojave. The camp is a sprawling complex with various tents serving as barracks, medical stations, and supply depots. The terminal building, once a bustling hub for air travel, now houses the NCR Command Center, a science lab, and an interrogation room where Lieutenant Carrie Boyd extracts information from captured spies. Above, the Old World monorail still runs, reserved for the NCR military and VIPs, offering a quick route to the New Vegas Strip. Despite the NCR's best efforts, Camp McCarran remains a hotbed of conflict, with fiends constantly testing its defenses. The camp is home to unique items like the La Lounge Carbine, a rare cowboy repeater held by Corporal Sterling, and this machine, a powerful battle rifle awarded for dealing with a shady arms dealer named Contreras. But beneath the surface of this military stronghold lies a constant struggle to maintain order in a land teetering on the edge of chaos. Vault 11 is one of the most twisted and disturbing tales hidden in the Mojave Wasteland. Congratulations, Martyr. Your fantastic journey is only just beginning. Please proceed to the light. The light is calming and puts your mind at ease. Go to the light. A place where hope was snuffed out by fear and humanity's darkest instincts were laid bare. Unlike many of the other vaults, Vault 11 was constructed with a purpose that had nothing to do with preservation and everything to do with psychological manipulation. What happened within its sealed doors is a story of despair, betrayal, and a desperate struggle for survival. A story that still echoes within its desolate halls. The vault was one of five constructed in the Mojave region. That's purpose hidden beneath layers of lies and deception. Upon sealing the doors, the inhabitants were greeted not with the promise of safety, but with a horrific ultimatum. They were to sacrifice one of their own every year, or else the entire population of the vault would be executed. Unbeknownst to them, this was all a cruel trick, a twisted social experiment devised by vault -Tec. If they had refused to sacrifice anyone, the vault's computer would have revealed the truth, commended them for their commitment to life, and unlocking the vault doors as a reward. Congratulations, citizens of Vault 11. You have made the decision not to sacrifice one of your own. You can walk with your head held high knowing that your commitment to human life is a shining example to us all. And to make that feeling of pride even sweeter, I have some exciting news. Despite what you were led to believe, the population of Vault 11 is not going to be exterminated for its disobedience. Instead, the mechanism to open the main vault door has now been enabled, and you can come and go at your leisure. But not so fast. Be sure to check with your overseer to find out if it's safe to leave. Here at vault Tech, your safety is our number one priority. But... The residents never knew that. Instead, they believed in the deadly ultimatum with a fervor that would ultimately tear them apart. In the beginning, the residents tried to find a way to cope with their grim reality. They established a system of elections where the chosen individual would be elected as overseer, only to be sacrificed at the end of their term. It was a dark parody of democracy, where winning the vote meant a death sentence. You've led a great life. Living it has been its own reward. But it is only the beginning. Close your eyes now and imagine what joys await you in the next life, the afterlife. Can you see them? Good. The vault's original overseer, who had known the truth from the start, was the first to be sacrificed. A decision made in anger and betrayal 
by the very people he was meant to protect. For 16 years, the Vault's grim tradition continued. Six political factions emerged, each one vying for control, each one trying to avoid the overseer's chair. These factions manipulated, coerced, and even blackmailed their way to power. Their propaganda plastered across the Vault's walls like a sickening reminder of their predicament. Amongst them, the Justice Bloc, led by Roy Gottlieb, became the most powerful and the most corrupt. The tale of Vault 11 reaches its horrifying crescendo with the story of Catherine Stone, a resident who was coerced into a vile act by the Justice Bloc. They threatened her with the death of her husband, forcing her to submit to their demands. Even after she complied, they nominated her husband anyway, sealing his fate. Driven by fury and desperation, Catherine took matters into her own hands, murdering the members of the Justice Bloc one by one. Her actions were a last, desperate attempt to save her husband, and in a twisted way, she succeeded. The murders secured her place as the next overseer, sparing her husband's life, but at a terrible cost. Catherine's first act as overseer was to dismantle the election process entirely, leaving the choice of the next overseer up to the vault's computer systems. The remaining members of the Justice Bloc, unwilling to relinquish their grip on power, attempted a coup, resulting in a bloody conflict that decimated the vault's population. By the end, only five survivors remained. These five, wary and broken, decided to confront the vault's computer refusing to continue the cycle of sacrifices. It was only then that the truth was revealed to them that the sacrifices had never been necessary, that their willingness to refuse was the real test. The revelation was too much to bear. In their final moments, four of the survivors decided to end their lives, unable to live with the weight of their actions. The fifth, whose fate remains unknown, chose to live perhaps to carry the burden of the vault's secret into the world beyond. All right, I know you can hear me, so listen up. There's five of us left. Five out of, I don't know how many. So, it's over. We've talked and it's over. We're not gonna send anybody to die anymore. So shut off our water, our gases, or do whatever it is you're programmed to do. But we're done listening to you. Vault 11 is a testament to the horrors that can unfold when fear and manipulation take hold. Its halls are littered with the remnants of a society that tore itself apart, the walls still echoing with the whispers of its long dead inhabitants. The story of Vault 11 isn't just about survival, it's about the darkness that lies within all of us, and the choices we make when pushed to the brink. This harrowing tale serves as a reminder of the depths to which humanity can sink when faced with impossible choices, and the terrifying power of those who pull the strings from behind the curtain. Vault 11 is a place where the American dream became a nightmare, and where the true cost of survival was paid in blood. The Atomic Wrangler Bar and Casino, tucked away in the chaotic streets of Freeside, is the go-to spot for those who can't afford the luxury of the Strip. By 2281, this once modest pre-war establishment has evolved into a thriving casino, flop house, and brothel, all under the shrewd management of the Garrett twins, James and Francine. It's a place where the desperate and the daring come to gamble away their meager caps, indulging in chems, or seeking comfort from the area's most notorious quote-unquote professionals. The Wrangler is more than just a steady joint. It's a microcosm of Freeside itself, where survival is a game of chance and the stakes are always high. The interior of the Atomic Wrangler is as gritty as its reputation, with a vaulted ceiling and a bar that serves as the heart of the establishment. The main floor offers a mix of entertainment, from the clinking of slot machines to the loud cheers at the card tables. Upstairs, the Garrett twins and their employees reside, guarding the secrets and the loot of the casino. Despite its rough exterior, the Atomic Wrangler remains a vital part of Freeside's economy, 
offering his patrons a last shot at luck before the dangers of the wasteland reclaim them. Helios 1, before the Great War, was more than just a solar power plant. It was a beacon of America's promise, established by Poseidon Energy. It was meant to light up the Las Vegas Strip and power the region, heralding a golden age of renewable energy. But behind this facade, Helios 1 housed two of the U.S.'s Army's top secret projects, a laser defense system called Archimedes and an experimental orbital weapon, Archimedes II. These projects, shrouded in secrecy, were overseen by military officials who were determined to keep their advancements hidden from enemy eyes, especially from China. Centuries later, the Mojave Brotherhood of Steel discovered the facility under the command of Elder Elijah. They aimed to unlock its secrets, believing that Helios I held a significant military advantage. This belief led to a bitter conflict with the New California Republic, culminating in a desperate two-year battle known as Operation Sunburst. Despite their advanced technology, the Brotherhood was vastly outnumbered and ultimately forced to retreat, leaving the plant in New California Republic hands. However, the NCR's victory was bittersweet. The plant's systems had been sabotaged, and despite their best efforts, they could only get it running at a fraction of its potential. Also, a chem addict. Ironically, they hired him as the principal engineer, and he only added to their troubles, leaving Helios 1 more of a burden than a boon. Now, behind the scenes, the real-world location of Helios 1 mirrors the Nevada Solar 1 facility, situated southwest of Boulder City. The name Helios draws from Greek mythology, symbolizing the sun, a fitting name for a plant meant to harness solar power but one that ultimately became a relic of lost potential, caught between the ambitions of men and the devastation of war. Vault 3 was one of the few vault tech creations in the Mojave meant to be a beacon of normalcy. Unlike its twisted counterparts, this vault wasn't designed for psychological experiments or horrific trials. It was simply a shelter, a haven built to house civilians in the chaotic world after the bombs fell. For years, it served its purpose well, hidden amidst the blocks of South Vegas. Vault 3 was a place where life carried on in the shadow of the apocalypse, untouched by the madness that gripped so many other vaults. But peace is the fleeting thing in the wasteland. When a water leak forced the inhabitants to open their doors and seek help from the outside world, it seemed like a minor setback. For a brief moment, they thrived trading with neighboring communities, and forming connections that brought hope to their isolated existence. Yet, this newfound openness also drew the attention of the Fiends, a brutal gang of chem-addicted raiders who saw the vault not as a community, but as prey. The Fiends, led by the ruthless Motor Runner, saw an opportunity, exploiting the vault dwellers, trust, and naivety. They conned their way inside. What followed was a massacre, an act of violence that ended with the vault's original inhabitants slaughtered. Their sanctuary turned into a den of madness and addiction. Motor Runner, seizing the vault's strategic value, transformed it into an impenetrable base for his gang. A fortress from which the fiends could launch raids on the NCR and the surrounding wasteland. Vault 3, once a symbol of hope, became a stronghold of terror. The graffiti-covered walls and drug-littered floors tell the tale of a place where innocence was lost and darkness took hold. Now, the vault is a dangerous maze of rooms filled with fiends, their presence a constant threat to the people of New Vegas, and a thorn in the side of the NCR forces stationed at Camp McCarran. The layout of Vault 3 is a twisted reflection of its fall from grace. The recreation area, once a place of joy, now serves as storage for the fiend's spoils. The maintenance wing houses Motor Runner and his guard dogs, Bone Gnash and Gnash Bone, in a throne room that reeks of despair. The living quarters, where families once slept peacefully, now hold prisoners and the decaying bodies of those who couldn't escape the fiend's wrath. Vault 3's tragic story is a stark reminder of the dangers that lurk in the wasteland. 
what was once a refuge is now a graveyard of lost souls, a testament to the wasteland's cruel reality. The vault stands as a monument to the fragility of hope, where the promise of safety was shattered by the brutal hand of fate. Fortification Hill Once known as a simple military site before the Great War, hides a powerful secret beneath its rocky surface. Mr. Robert House, the enigmatic leader of New Vegas, used the site to conceal a vast army of Securitrons, tucked away in a hidden vault. While Caesar's Legion believes they control the area, they remain unaware of the dormant robotic force lying in wait just below them, a ticking time bomb that could change the fate of the Mojave. In 2277, Caesar's Legion made Fortification Hill their stronghold, positioning themselves for the second battle of Hoover Dam. Kaiser himself commands from the hilltop, surrounded by his loyal Praetorian Guard. The Legion's presence there is a testament to their power, yet they remain blind to the true danger just beneath their feet. Robert House's hidden army ready to awaken and disrupt their plans at any moment. Black Mountain was once a military communications hub, spared from direct nuclear strikes but left heavily aerated. Post-war, it became a mutant stronghold led by Marcus until he was forced out by the unstable nightkin, Tabitha. Under her rule, Black Mountain became a fortress, with super mutants killing any humans who approached. Tabitha used the site's old radio array to broadcast her deranged messages across the Mojave. The peak is heavily guarded by mutants, and within, Raul the Ghoul is imprisoned. Took you long enough. So can I go now? Freeing him often triggers the confrontation with Tabitha. The site also houses Rhonda, a broken robot central to Tabitha's delusions, which, if repaired, can alter the outcome at Black Mountain. Interstate 15, also known as I-15 or Long 15, is a remnant of the pre-war world, stretching across the Mojave wasteland as a silent witness to the past. Once a vital artery connecting bustling cities like Los Angeles and Las Vegas, it now serves as a hazardous route through a desolate landscape. In the days before the Great War, this highway was teeming with life, carrying vacationers and commuters across state lines. But in the post-apocalyptic world of 2281, it has become a treacherous path plagued by death claws, powder gangers, and the ever encroaching influence of the New California Republic and Caesar Legion. Despite the dangers, I-15 remains a crucial route for those brave enough to travel its broken asphalt. The NCR attempts to maintain control over this vital highway, patrolling it to protect the scattered communities that rely on the road for trade and survival. However, the stretch between Sloan and the Junction 15 railway station is particularly peerless with death claws claiming the area as their own. The highway's crumbling overpasses and mine paths symbolize the fragile balance of power in the Mojave, where each faction fights not just for dominance, but for the survival of their people in a world where even the roads are a battlefield. The Thorn is an underground arena in the Mojave wasteland, where wasteland creatures are pitted against each other for sport. Located just outside of Westside, the Thorn offers a gritty, raw spectacle where bets can be placed on the outcome of these brutal fights. The arena, overseen by Red Lucy, allows participants to arrange custom fights or even join in the action themselves, battling everything from giant mantises to death claws. Winning brings caps and glory, but the price of participation is steep, with fights requiring payment up front due to the high cost of maintaining the creatures. The atmosphere inside the Thorn is tense, with raised catwalks surrounding the area for spectators and guards. The fights can be chaotic, and even the most seasoned wastelanders must tread carefully. Any misstep could lead to hostile guards or deadly encounters with the creatures. Despite the dangers, the allure of the Thorn draws a crowd, from hardened fighters to curious onlookers, all eager to see who or what 
will emerge victorious. Let's turn our attention to Good Springs, a small town with a big place in the history of the Mojave. Named after the Good Springs source, this settlement was rebuilt after the Great War thanks to a grant from the New California Republic, leveraging its water supply to establish a mining operation. The locals have always cherished the town's peaceful nature, even though trouble has never been too far away. By 2281, Good Springs had never seen its fair share of challenges. The escape of violent convicts from the nearby NCR correctional facility, who later formed the Powder Gangers, brought new dangers to the town. Trade routes were cut off due to death call infestation at Quarry Junction, leaving the town increasingly isolated and vulnerable. But Good Springs became truly significant one fateful night when Benny, the leader of the chairman, ambushed a courier near the town. After taking a platinum chip from the courier, Benny left them for dead in a shallow grave at the Good Springs Cemetery. However, fate intervened. A Securitron, under Mr. House's command, dug up the barely alive courier and brought them to Doc Mitchell's house, where they were nursed back to health. This seemingly quiet town quickly became the starting point for an epic tale. The buildings scattered around Good Springs, the Prospector Saloon, Doc Mitchell's house, and the schoolhouse may seem modest, but they are the backdrop for the beginning of a journey that will shape the entire Mojave wasteland. Good Springs stands as a testament to resilience, a small outpost of civilization struggling to survive amidst the chaos of the post-war world. It's a place where history was made, even if the town itself remains quiet and unassuming. The old nuclear test site in the Mojave Wasteland is a haunting reminder of the pre-war world, where nuclear weapons were tested, leaving the area heavily irradiated even decades later. Located between Caesar's Legion safe house and the crash of Bird, this site is overrun with feral ghoul reavers and glowing ones. While most of the site is fenced off, the nuclear test shack can be explored, though it is dangerously radioactive. On a nearby hill, an eerie observation area with abandoned chairs and authority glasses overlook the test site, a nod to the days when nuclear tests were a grim spectacle. Camp Searchlight was once a bustling military hub for the NCR, strategically located at the crossroads of Nevada State Route 164 and Highway 95. However, it was tragically transformed into a radioactive wasteland due to a cunning sabotage by Caesar's Legion. Utilizing gaps in the NCR patrols, Legion operatives infiltrated the camp and unsealed old nuclear waste casts stored in the town's fire station, releasing lethal radiation that decimated the camp's personnel. The once thriving base is now haunted by feral ghouls, the remnants of NCR soldiers who were caught in the fallout. While the surviving troopers, led by First Sergeant Astor, are left to grapple with the aftermath. The town itself is eerily preserved despite the devastation, with key structures like the firehouse and the police station still standing, though heavily irradiated. Within these buildings, valuable items such as the unique fire axe Knock Knock and other remnants of the NCR's presence can be found. However, the town's streets are peerless filled with ghoulified soldiers and hidden threats. The story of Camp Searchlight is one of a bitter downfall, where a stronghold of the Mojave was undone, not by direct attack, but by the silent, deadly seep of radiation. Cottonwood Cove, once a tranquil resort on the Colorado River, became a pivotal outpost for Caesar's Legion by 2281, led by Conturian Aurelius of Phoenix. The cove serves as a key staging ground for legion raids and the grim processing site where captives are ferried across the river into Arizona to be enslaved. This stronghold is the legion's largest encampment on the western side of the Colorado, vital for transferring troops and supplies to Fortification Hill. The cove's strategic importance was solidified after Frumentari's, Vulpas, and Colta orchestrated the destruction of Camp Searchlight 
by releasing nuclear waste, drenching the area in deadly radiation, and eliminating the NCR's presence nearby. This allowed the Legion to establish a firm foothold with communication strictly handled through ham radios to avoid interception. The Cove's efficiency is brutal. Aurelius boosts the record of capturing and killing NCR soldiers at four times the rate of his own losses. Among the secrets of Cottonwood Cove is the precarious truck filled with nuclear waste perched above the camp at the Cottonwood Overlook. With the right skills, one could unleash the barrels flooding the cove with radiation and annihilating its inhabitants in an instant. Interestingly, the in-game Cottonwood Cove is based on the real-world Cottonwood Cove Resort and Marina in Nevada, with its layout and structures mirroring the actual resort. And for those with the wild wasteland trait, there's a quirky easter egg, a nod to Monty Python's Life of Brian with the, and don't quote me because I know that I'm not going to get this right, Romains and the Domas. It's a humorous mistranslation of Romans Go Home, and it's scrawled on the HQ building side. Lone Wolf Radio, a name that once might have sent chills down the spine of those who dared to listen. This old, rusted trailer, perched precariously on the edge of the Mojave Wasteland, was once the nerve center of a lone man's war against the shadows of government control. Long before the world was bathed in nuclear fire, this solitary voice echoed through the airways, fueled by paranoia, passion, and whiskey. He was a self-proclaimed guardian of truth, a renegade broadcaster who fought the good fight against an unseen enemy. But when the bombs fell, his voice, like so many others, was silenced. By the time you stumble upon it in 2281, Lone Wolf Radio is a ghost of its former self a graveyard of forgotten battles and unfulfilled promises. The trailer, tucked away south of Good Springs, whispers stories of a man driven to the edge. Inside, the air is thick with the scent of dust and decay. The walls, once alive with the hum of radio equipment, are now silent, save for the haunting words scald in desperation. Quote unquote, everyone is gone. I am all alone. Let it all end. Quote unquote. Empty whiskey bottles and broken dreams litter the floor, a testament to a man who fought until he could fight no more. But even in its desolation, Lone Wolf Radio holds a few remnants of its past. A worn copy of the Wasteland Survival Guide lies near a tattered bed. A lone sunset sarsaparilla star bottle cap sits nearby and scattered amongst the debris are parts needed to breathe life into a broken companion like EDE. This place, once the heartbeat of rebellion, now offers only the faintest echoes of its former glory. What makes Lone Wolf Radio truly fascinating though, is the legend it has spawned. Some say it was the lair of a child serial killer, a twisted figure whose voice still lingers in the static, waiting to lure the unwary. But these tales, as thrilling as they are, have been dismissed by the creators of the wasteland as mere fiction crafted by the fans who couldn't resist adding another layer of darkness to an already bleak world. Still, the eerie similarities between Lone Wolf and the real world legend of Wolfman Jack are hard to ignore. Like the pirate radio host of the 1960s who defied the law and broadcast his rebellious messages from a hidden location. The Lone Wolf Radio of the Mojave was a man who stood against the tide, his voice a beacon for those who dared to listen. But where Wolfman Jack's voice became the stuff of legend, the Lone Wolf's voice faded into the background, leaving behind only a trailer, a few scattered memories, and a chilling reminder of how easily even the loudest voices can be lost to time. As you leave Lone Wolf Radio behind, remember not just as another stop in your journey, but as a symbol of the countless forgotten warriors who fought battles that history has all but erased. Here, in this rusted shell, lies the story of a man who dared to speak out, even when no one was left to hear him. Now, let's explore Novak, a small, unassuming town along Highway 95 that has become a vital stopover in the Mojave. Before the Great War, Novak was little more than a pit stop for travelers looking for a place to rest. For fuel, and maybe catch a glimpse of its famous roadside attractions like Dinky the Dinosaur and the world's second largest thermometer. 
the name Novak itself comes from a broken sign that once read No Vacancy, now reads Novak. After the war, the motel and surrounding area were resettled, and Novak slowly grew into a tight-knit community. By 2281, the town is guarded by two skilled first recon snipers, Craig Boone and Manny Vargas, who take shifts watching over the area from their sniper's nest inside Dinky the T-Rex's mouth. Ranger Andy, a former NCR ranger forced into early retirement due to injuries, has also taken up residence here, lending his expertise to the town's defense. Novak's proximity to the Repcon test site has allowed it to thrive on salvaging and trade. But the town faces growing threats. Caesar's Legion looms to the east, and the arrival of the Bright Brotherhood, along with increased feral ghoul activity blocking access to Repcon, has everyone on edge. Despite these dangers, the recent shutdown of Interstate 15 has rerouted caravan traffic onto Highway 95, bringing more travelers and more trouble to Novak's door. The heart of Novak is the Dino Delight Motel, where Jenny Mae Crawford, the motel's proprietor, rents out rooms to travelers. Across the street, the Dino Bite Gift Shop, housed with Dinky the Dinosaur, offers supplies and souvenirs, including a few rare items for those in the know. Yet, beneath its quaint exterior, Novak hides the darker side, with secrets waiting to be uncovered, especially if you dig into the town's past, or get too close to its residents. In Novak, survival is a day-to-day -day affair, but the people here are resilient, banded together to protect their little corner of the Mojave. Whether you're just passing through or staying a while, Novak is a place where every shadow hides a story, and every resident has something at stake. The Great Khan Armory is a hidden stash, located in the basement of a ruined house at the southern entrance of Red Rock Canyon. Access through a cellar door, this secretive army is guarded by a Great Khan and offers a variety of weapons and supplies. However, the armor only trades with those who have earned the Khan's trust, requiring an accepted or higher reputation. Inside, you'll find a workbench, a reloading bench, and a hard locked gate secure in their valuable stockpile. Only the most trusted allies gain access to this well guarded cache. In the shadow of the California Nevada border, Hopeville and Ashton were once small, isolated towns that hid a dark secret beneath their picturesque exteriors. These communities, built to embody the American dream, masked a network of nuclear missile silos part of a desperate attempt by the United States to safeguard its future, but the ground beneath them was unstable, prone to tremors that shook the very foundation of the nation's defenses. The military, blinded by their own hubris, ignored the warnings, confident that American engineering would prevail. As the Sino-American War dragged on, Hopeville and Ashton became a crucible of dissent the towns attracted those who dared to question the government, protesters who rallied against the war and the military industrial complex. These dissenters were swiftly silenced, rounded up, and sent to Big Mountain as unwilling test subjects. The towns themselves, however, were left to their own devices until the bombs fell. When the Great War erupted, the missiles hidden beneath Hopeville and Ashton remain dormant, their destructive potential unrealized. The towns were abandoned, left to rot in the aftermath of the apocalypse. But life found a way to endure. A small community arose from the ashes, clinging to the remnants of the old world. This community, which would come to be known as the Divide, was a place where the past and the present collided, where the legacy of America's hubris lingered like a specter. The divide was more than just a settlement. It was a bridge between the new California Republic in the west and the untamed Mojave in the east. It was a place where the promises of a new nation flickered to life. A nation that could unite the fractured remains of the old world. But this fragile hope was sustained by the courage of a single courier who braved the treacherous roads to keep the community connected to the outside world. Their repeated journeys 
gave the divide a lifeline, a tremendous link to the wider world. But hope can be a dangerous thing. The same courier who nurtured the divide would also be its undoing. A package, innocently delivered, activated the dormant missiles hidden beneath the ground. The resulting cataclysm was swift and devastating. Earthquakes ripped through the land, twisting and shattering the very earth itself. Hopeville and Ashton were torn apart. Their once proud structures reduced to rubble. The Divide was no longer a place of hope, but a land of death and despair, where the winds howled with the fury of the past. Those who survived the devastation were transformed into something less than human. Their bodies twisted by radiation, their minds consumed by hatred. These marked men, as they came to be known, were the living embodiment of the Divide's curse, a reminder of what happens when the past is left to fester and rot. The Divide became a scar on the land, a place where the old world's sins were laid bare for all to see. It was a testament to the fragility of hope and the destructive power of the past. In the end, the Divide was a place where history refused to die, where the ghosts of the old world lingered, waiting for the day when they would finally be put to rest. Next with Freeside, we step into the gritty, forgotten outskirts of New Vegas. While Las Vegas itself was spared the worst of the Great War, the area now known as Freeside was left to decay, overrun by tribes and raiders for years. It was a lawless land, where the remnants of old Las Vegas were picked over by those desperate enough to survive. When Mr. House re-emerged in 2274 to restore the strip, he saw Freeside as a necessary buffer, a place to filter out the undesirables. Offering no aid, House focused solely on the strip, leaving Freeside to fend for itself. Over time, the area degenerated into a slum, a haven for criminals and those forgotten by the magnificence of New Vegas. Despite the chaos, Freeside found a semblance of order thanks to two groups, the Kings, who impose a rough sort of peace, and the followers of the Apocalypse, who provide much needed humanitarian aid from their base at the old Mormon fort. But even with these factions in place, life in Freeside is a daily struggle, as locals face threats both from within and from the encroaching NCR forces. By 2281, Freeside stands as a stark contrast to the Glittering Strip, a place where survival often depends on who you know and how well you can navigate its treacherous streets. Vault 34 was one of the Mojave's most notorious vaults, designed with an ominous social experiment in mind. Unlike other vaults that limited weapons, Vault 34's armory was packed to the brim with firearms and ammunition, tempting fate with an overabundance of firepower. This might have seemed like a gift, but it became the vault's curse. As the population grew beyond control, tensions skyrocketed. The overcrowded conditions sparked chaos when the overseer, fearing the consequences of open access to the armory, locked it down remotely. But you can't cage fear and desperation riots broke out. And in a bloody exodus, a group of residents stormed out of the vault, eventually becoming the infamous boomers of Nellis Air Force Base. Those who remained weren't so lucky. The revolt against the overseer's population control measures backfired drastically. The vault's reactor was damaged in the chaos, leaking deadly radiation. Trapped inside, the residents slowly succumbed to the radiation, transforming into feral ghouls. Now. The once thriving Vault 34 is a nightmarish maze of irrated corridors where the remnants of humanity's hubris lurk in the shadows. Admits this radioactive hellscape, some unique treasures remain, like the All-American, a powerful marksman carbine hidden in the Vault's armory, and the Pulse Gun, a weapon of legend sought after by those who know its secrets, but to claim these relics, you must first brave the deadly ghouls and the ever-present radiation. Reminders, 
of Vault 34's Grim Legacy. Highway 95, or Route 95, is one of the critical lifelines in the Mojave Wasteland, connecting New Vegas to the outlying territories. After the Great War, this pre-war roadway became a vital passage for NCR soldiers and civilians traveling to and from the Strip. When Interstate 15 was shut down due to the death call infestation at Quarry Junction, traffic was diverted to Highway 95, bringing much needed business to the settlements along its routes. The highway snakes through the wasteland, beginning from a radioactive roadblock in the northwest and winding its way south through key locations like the 188 Trade Post, Novak, and Camp Searchlight, before exiting the Mojave through a collapsed tunnel beneath Camp Searchlight. In game, it remained a testament to the enduring infrastructure of the old world, now repurposed for survival in a new. The Sunset's Asperilla headquarters stands as a relic of the pre-war world. Its decaying structure, a stark contrast to the bustling operation it once was. The gigantic bottle that crowns the entrance is a beacon of nostalgia, luring travelers into its depths. Inside. The factory is a maze of conveyor belts, storage rooms, and offices, each telling a story of a bygone era when Sunset Sarsaparilla was a household name. The air is thick with the scent of dust and rust, and the soft hum of machinery long past its prime fills the silence. Exploring further, you'll encounter Festus, the friendly yet eerie cowboy robot who offers a chance to uncover a long lost treasure, if you can gather enough star bottle caps that is. As you dive into the heart of the facility, you stumble upon the remnants of corporate secrets, including a hidden vault where the enigmatic Alan Marks met his end. Among the crates of Sunset Sarsaparilla, you'll find the powerful Pew Pew laser pistol, a reward for those who dare to uncover the mysteries of this forgotten place. The headquarters isn't just a location, it's a snapshot of a world frozen in time, offering a glimpse into the lives and ambitions that once thrived there. If you've made it this far, I want to say thank you. And if you haven't already, consider hitting that subscribe button. I'm on the road to 1000 subscribers, and every single one of you helps me get closer to investing in better computer equipment, which means I can create even more stunning films for you. It took me over 200, literally 200 hours to put this together from everything from researching to writing and editing. So if you enjoyed this deep dive into the backstories of the Mojave's most iconic locations, there's so much more to come. We've explored the hidden depths of the Thorn, uncovered the tragic history of the old nuclear test site, and revisited the nostalgic glow of the fabulous New Vegas sign. But there's still more to uncover in this world. And if this video hits 500 likes, I'll make another one just like it, diving into even more locations from the Fallout universe. And up next, I'll be revealing the secrets of the Great War, covering everything from the shadowy beginnings of the resource wars to the Sino-American conflict and the world-changing possibilities of cold fusion that could have altered the course of history. If you thought this was epic, you won't want to miss what's coming next. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Corn out.